So Susan Howe wrote a long, critical, philological, historical prose poem, My Emily Dickinson. Um, and we're going to look at a few passages of it. And I guess one of the questions we're going to end up with is why these, these writers, the language poets so-called, felt that Dickinson spoke to them. What is it about Dickinson that, that really drew, drew them to her? So we'll begin by looking at a passage in, in My Emily Dickinson about Dickinson and Stein. Um, she notices first that Harold Bloom and Hugh Kenner and, and folks like them drop their names and ignore their works in canonical criticism or do some kind of biographical stuff about, about their eccentricities and kind of lovely strangeness. Mad Woman in the Attic in the case of uh, Dickinson. Uh, and then uh, in this passage, Howe turns to some very powerful ideas here. Dickinson and Stein meet each other along the paths of the self that begin and end in contradiction. Um, and, and that subversion, uh, subversion uh, attracts them. So let me read a little passage here and you guys can interpret it. In prose and in poetry, she explored the implications of breaking the law this is Dickinson, just short of breaking off communication with the reader. Starting from scratch, she exploded habits of standard human intercourse as she cut across the customary chronological linearity of poetry. What could, what could Susan Howe mean by that? And why embrace that value in Dickinson? Look back to the 19th century. And what does that tell us about the poetry we've been talking about this week? Who wants to start? Kristen, what does it mean to say that Emily Dickinson's, he, you know, she's in a room in Amherst. How could she be breaking the law? Well, breaking the laws of grammar. You know, Emily Dickinson's syntax is extremely unusual for her time period, as we talked about when we did for ours, originally. I think. Yeah, I mean, she's got all of these dashes, and the line breaks are strange. Capitalization. And the capitalization is very strange. But more, I mean, yeah. what Ray Armentrout calls her, I think, witchy word choice. Mm -hmm. um, where any, every word has, it's open to the reader's interpretation. Okay. So why does Susan Howe embrace this as breaking the law? Is Susan Howe, is, is there something illegal about Emily Dickinson? Contraband? I don't, I wouldn't say illegal or contraband. Well, I'm being funny. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, how, <laughs> how, I mean, appreciates what Emily Dickinson is doing because she's, She's kind of not making language new in, in the Williams sense, but she's opening it up to reader participation. Why would anyone, Molly, seek to break off, to get toward breaking off communication with the reader? I thought these language poets were all about a new kind of relationship with the reader. Well, I think they believe that in order for that communication with the reader to be successful, that you have to break it. You can't use this traditional conventional form to really get at the heart of, of issues of communication. So what is at risk? What, can you imagine a writing that breaks off communication entirely with the reader? Well, I think it goes back to Hygienian's undone is not the same thing as not done in the sense that breaking off conventional forms of communication creates a space for a new kind because Dickinson was so focused on a life of the consciousness and recreating the consciousness in her house of possibility. So by perhaps shocking the readers of her time with a new grammar that took some time to become familiar with, um, she opened the space for the language poets to inhabit. She pairs uh, Dickinson with Stein, which is not something that I think the Dickinsonians before this time had done much of, because as she acknowledges, they're very different personalities. Uh, but she talks about Stein, and then she says, how does? Repetition, surprise, alliteration, odd rhyme and rhythm, dislocation, deconstruction. To restore the original clarity of each word skeleton, both women, Dickinson and Stein, lifted the load of European literary custom, adopting old strategies they reviewed and reinvented them. Anything need to be said about that? Where does Stein fit into this? It's okay to repeat something we've said before, repetition being the word of the day. 
Where does Stein fit in this, Molly? Well, Stein is really interested in stripping uh, the baggage and the associations of each word to really get to what the word is representing. She's into building these subject relationships by trying words in different ways and different word pairings. And you can't do that with you know traditional descriptions. OK. So we have Stein and Dickinson. And finally, in this passage, Susan Howe says, Emily Dickinson and Gertrude Stein also conducted a skillful and ironic investigation of patriarchal authority over literary history. Who polices questions of grammar? This is a question that I've been paraphrasing for a long time. Who polices questions of grammar, parts of speech, connection, and connotation? Whose order is shut inside the structure of a sentence? What inner articulation releases the coils and complications of sayings, capital S, sayings, assertion? In very different ways, the counter movement of these two women's work penetrates to the indefinite limits of written communication. I mean, I think this is like probably one of the most important things that we'll read in all of my Emily Dickinson, because what she's saying is that what Dickinson and Stein were able to do with their unconven or unconventional language, syntax, you mm -hmm. know, subject matters, constructions, whatever, they were able to pose the question of who polices questions of grammar. And maybe the answer to that question, and this is what they're kind of pushing against, is that the, the patriarchal male-dominated literary canon are the ones that police questions of grammar, parts of speech, connection, connotation. In the case of Dickinson, editors literally would, took would take dashes a, away, fixed rhymes. I mean, yeah. it totally... So that's what, that's what might be meant in the Dickinsonian example particularly, but more generally, who polices questions of grammar? What's, what's actually the answer, Emily Harnett, in your life as a student, who polices questions of grammar? Teachers. And parts of speech. Teachers. And how do they do it? Red pens. And? Papers. And not in your case, because you always get A's, but Clearly. they can give you a B minus. <laughs> Has anybody here at this table as an American student ever written a paper and gotten it corrected? I think the teachers still say I'm correcting papers, right? And been penalized for writing a little bit out of the box. Anybody? Yeah, in elementary school and in junior high school. Okay, who polices questions of grammar when the teachers are no longer there? I think you have a BA. Yes? I do. So you don't have any teachers officially. No, not right I'm now. I'm kind of not really counting in this case. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You now, do, of now course. I my Why own do you do that? Grammar. Why do you do that? Uh, to have my language be something that society recognizes. Mm -hmm. Something that's that I can communicate with. Mm -hmm. And what's at risk if you push, um, if you break the laws just short of cutting off communication with that world that you seem to be committed to communicating with? I mean, it's if as a, as someone who aspires to be a writer, I would have no audience. So there's a risk of having no audience, and really, Dickinson essentially didn't have an audience of her time. So, why are we valorizing? Why is Susan Howe valorizing a writer who wrote and had no audience in her time? But maybe having and, no audience is why she could do what she did. I don't know, maybe. Max? That. Is I don't this know. She, she probably she she tried to get her poems published at some point, so she definitely wanted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. We can quibble right. with all that. I mean, essentially, <laughs> essentially, burned, Susan Howe is embracing someone who broke the laws. The laws that so Kristen yes. is is a law-abiding citizen for the most part. Yeah, I don't yeah. need to. <laughs> I'm, I'm making you a straw writer. <laughs> well, it's she's it's, a law-abiding abiding uh, user of language. Emily Dickinson was a lawbreaker. Susan Howe is embracing the law breaker. And she says something large. Who polices questions of grammar, parts of speech, connection, and connotation? It is, Susan Howe would say, and she's not a traditional feminist, but here she's being you know, just about as adamant and just about as radical as you can possibly be by taking that grammatical superego that, that has been naturalized in the mind of this particular writer, Kristen Martin, 
And she's saying, you know, you've just, you've assumed something that's a particular enforcement of a particular kind of literary history. Patriarchal is almost a standing word. It's really about the buzz of empire building and the excitement of gilded wealth of the 19th century. This is a big resistance. Where were we, Max? Oh, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Whose order is shut inside the structure of a sentence? And what inner articulation releases the coils and complications of saying his assertion? And finally, you can, add, you can respond to any of this, in very different ways, the counter movement of these two women's work, Stein and Dickinson, penetrates to language poetry, language poetry, the indefinite limits of written communication. It's, I think it's, it's interesting that she's pointing to Dickinson as someone who's... Or, or she's pointing to this idea of breaking the law up until a point. Like, like she doesn't break the law entirely. And this... The, the lineage here, I think, that, or that maybe we're, we're implying or, or that we're trying to make between Dickinson and the language poets is, is evident in, in the, the Silliman and the Hyginian that we read, for instance, where they're also breaking the, the laws of, of narrative or of form, but only of, up until a point. Of what, of what a life, how a life gets told about. Them. Sure, but their, but their intervention only goes so far, and, and they're still using sentences. They're still using a sort of a, a logic of, of communication, something that we recognize, even if they are rearranging the sentences. They could have gone further. They could have, and they could have just and, written like And did in other writings. Books. Yeah. Sure, but in the ones that we read, it's it's up yes, but isn't it? I mean, I would suggest submit to you that it's even more powerful, more radical, that each of them take a a sentence that in most cases is a grammatically complete sentence, and set it next to another one, and defy us to apply our conventional syllogistic logic to the two of them. That's really that's really playing with conventional meaning, particularly when it's describing life. But you're, what you're saying is that there's a certain moderation involved in some of the ways in, the ways in which the language puts. Well, it's, it's a balance, to do this. definitely. But I don't think there's a lot of moderation in this line of powers. In very different ways, the counter movement of these two women's work penetrates to the indefinite limits of written communication. Who wants to speak to that phrase? Well, it's like you don't have to write, I guess, in the kind of you know, canonized modes that, that they're sort of pushing against to communicate something. That language actually has infinite possibilities if you, if you choose to exploit them. Um, I was thinking about the idea of language being political in two different aspects. In the one hand, conformity to standard English would mean conformity to a the way that a certain socioeconomic class speaks, and in that way it creates a political order that classifies others as less legitimate. So female poets, black poets, gay poets would suddenly have an inferior subgenre of poetry um, in the Shakespearean sense, um, which seems unfair if you're trying to recreate the social order in a way that all voices are heard or equally respected. And on the other side of that, um, in the idea that there is order within grammar, I think Stein was trying to unpack the idea that instead of privileging the verb and the noun, um, she instead focused on prepositions and pronouns um, in order to show that even just by disordering it, all those words still had resonance and meaning on their own. That she, I don't think she was consciously trying to um, be familiar in any sort of way. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of words for her are the glue that potentially holds it all together. And really, our investigation should be investigate. Here's a mixed metaphor: investigating the glue, which is less, a little less interested in the things that the glue holds together. Let's look at another passage uh, by Howe about Dickinson. I'll just read a couple of lines, and then you can help me understand it. Uh, Dickinson took the scraps from higher, separate higher female education. Uh, many bright women of her time were increasingly resenting, and combined them with voracious and unladylike outside reading. She got into all kinds of areas that were fairly uh, untraditional um, in an environment where confident ma masculine voices buzzed an alluring and inaccessible discourse. Uh, meantime, she went into geometry, geology, alchemy, philosophy, politics, biography, biology, mythology, philology, etc. 
A sheltered woman audaciously invented a new grammar grounded in humility and hesitation. Hesitate from the Latin stammer stick. Quotes Rustin, he may pause, but he must not hesitate. She means that negatively. And then she says hesitation circled back and surrounded everyone in that confident age of aggressive industrial expansion and brutal empire building. And then she hesitated. Why does she say this? Why is she embracing stammering and hesitation? Emily? Because it's, a, it's a, an unwillingness to be overconfident. It shows self-reflection and reflectiveness, a commitment to saying the right thing rather than just saying something. Good. That's a good start. Dave? Maybe uh, an undermining of the uh, authority of the, of the speaker of the poem. This is what I'm conveying. You are receiving it. Maybe she's undermining that dynamic. I know how to speak. You don't. Learn how to speak, and you will be articulate and you will get to articulate all the values that are naturalized and assumed in the way I speak. Right, and by refusing to do that, by stammering, by hesitating, you're basically foregrounding confusion in the face of confidence. Molly? And I think hesitation opens up those spaces we talked about in reading Silliman's work between the sentences, between the lines, you know, the 27th letter of the alphabet, where we can come in and, and bring our experience to the poem. Good. Let's focus on, before we move on, let's focus on this line. Hesitation, this sentence. Hesitation circled back and surrounded everyone in that confident age of aggressive industrial expansion and brutal, to use the word brutal, brutal, empire building. What do we do with that? That's fairly, that's a political thing. And, and, and what, what, what is her reading of Dickinson in this regard? What's she doing there? You're suggesting that hesitation is a political act. It's a rejection of that culture of aggression, of that uh, what American do we culture think of, the of time? hesitation and stammering. Of weakness, of weakness and an inability to understand. Let's turn that completely around, she says. This is why the poetry of Howe and her colleagues often will feature hesitation and stammering. Um, I love the stammering in the Bernstein poem where he gets the idiom wrong and he's reading it and deliberately adds the preposition on to the idiom and making it not quite make sense. Or even of Ashbery in a lyric poem like Some Trees where we, um, we, we, meet, out of, we meet somewhere um, as far from the world as agreeing with it. That kind of mix of idioms that makes no sense. If we really spend a little time with it, we realize that its stammer is very, very resistant mode. It's, this is, so Dickinson becomes power, a powerful form of social and political resistance, which is not the Dickinson that I learned as a kid, for sure. And in fact, it's, it's time to reveal, reveal, it sounds like there's something up my sleeve. <laughs> um, it's time to say that the Dickinson that we studied in this course is really Howe's Dickinson. You know, I don't know who's Whitman we were studying, but I know who's Dickinson we were studying. The, the Dickinson who, is a, who surprises us with her conceits, you know, who, who won't sit still. The Dickinson for whom, as Hygienian said, language won't stand still. Language is restless. Right, the restless world that this is for Dickinson is a, a world in which every witchy word choice is insufficient and needs to be abandoned for another place immediately. Not in the next poem, but within the poem itself. And speaking of that, let's, let's look at My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun um, briefly, because as a matter of fact, so much has been said about this poem. I don't expect us to do a close reading. All I want to do is ask you finally, why is it that Emily Dickinson, that, Emily Dickinson, that Susan Howe would, would write a whole book that riffs again and again on this one poem. What is it about this poem that would seem to satisfy Howe's urge to find a forebearer for her ideas about language? What is it about this poem that makes it right for her? Kristen? There's just so, so many things going on in it, and there's so much subversion, and every time you feel like you've got what one system of meaning is, it turns around on itself. So it, in the beginning, we think, 
my life had stood a loaded gun means that Emily Dickinson is a loaded gun, but not really. It's her life that's a loaded gun. And then the gun has the power, but she also has a master that she's answering to. And who has the power in that relationship? And there's just so much political meaning in it that it becomes a poem. It's a war poem, really. It's about the Civil War and how thinks of herself as a poet who wants to talk about appropriation and the frontier and war. So it's perfect for how. Good, good start. Who wants to add to that? I mean, for me, this poem is all about like potential, and like the I mean, potential of what? Well, in the first line, the potential of a loaded gun. The gun's loaded, but it's not been fired yet. But there's there's like, nothing more. I think the NRA makes a big deal out of this, in some kind of logic <laughs> about yeah. the second. No, seriously, the the <laughs> the loaded gun is there's something that has all that potential, and then of course their line is you have to use agency in order to fire it, right? So I'm not sure how that works out, but. The loaded gun is just powerful, it's powerful. It's more powerful than the gun that's been shot or the gun that's in the act of shooting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's powerful. And then that's an analogy to what? I mean, it's not just about a gun, right? No. What's, it, what's this potential here? I'll read her earlier line again, just to jog your memory. In a very different way, the counter movement of these two women's work Dickinson Stein penetrates to the indefinite limits of written communication. What's it an analogy to? Oh, queen of the meta? Um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking about exactly what Kristen was saying, how um, it's indeterminate, the word and what it's referencing. So we're unsure of all, and all these relationships could easily switch places and roles um, in the same way that perhaps she's ref referring to a romantic relationship. Um, that seems to be what the middle portion is about, but I was thinking about it. Of all the poems that Dickinson wrote, <laughs> 1770 of them, <sighs> this may be the one that we're still grappling with and we really don't have, I mean, thanks to, to, to Susan Howe, we, we, we know a lot more about it. Um, we could go on and on and on decades, well, centuries, and not know much more about this. How is that? How did language get to be this way? Do we just want to nod and say, oh my God, <laughs> what are we going to do with this? This is the, this is the thing, that, this is that, this is openness, that this woman in Amherst could have written a poem like this and we're still trying to figure it out. So, okay, here we go. This is the last question. We're going to wrap up. What's it about then? Oh, this is hard. What's it about? Isn't that just the point? It's about whatever the reader will take away from it. Is it anything goes? Uh-oh, we're really going to get our not detractors anything, anything going. Anything goes, it's but, not anything goes. We're working hard at this. But it's written in such a way with the confusion, confusion of uh, the subject here and there, some of the tense changes that it's intentionally ambiguous. You can take a bunch of different things of it. But I think it's about her poetic voice and the power of that. And she's telling us that she can, it's, it's violent. She can kill you with this She can poem. do she anything. Can look out. World. I mean, look, in a way, we're all that mill. All, every one of us is a mill by the stream. And Dickinson unleashes the power of the flood, her brain, her thinking, way off the tracks, way out of the box and we are trodden upon. Well, I mean, unless we mix the metaphor, get on board. <laughs> the mill, the mill in that- what, the mill or the <laughs> We don't know, I don't, it's very hard to stand Terrifying still and know power. where you are. The mill represents economic and social convention. We're producing power in a conventional way, the New England way of the 19th century. And mills are long forgotten in that regard. But this, the power of the imagination, the power of the mind to think and go where it's going to go, is alive and well. And I think that these, this, lay, this generation of poets, um, they wanted to recapture that radical spirit, the power of the imagination, without creating a romantic ideology of the imagination, the way the romantics did and maybe someone like Wallace Stevens did in the 20th century. So... What's it about? Last round, Max. Well, it's about a few different things. <laughs> there is something just so 
There's something so ominous about that last stanza that's that it's ominous because it's so unclear, I think. Good, let's, and let's end with it. Going. Though I than he may longer live, though I might live longer than he, he longer must than I. Uh-oh, that's a paradox. Yeah. Uh, for I have but... The, and so here's the reason why it's true what I just said, she says. For I have but the power to kill without the power to die. Okay, Max, you open the door. And it is because it's so uh, it's sort of syntactically naughty and unclear or open um, that it's hard to say exactly what she means. Um, to be sure. For I have but the power to kill without the power to die. It's either that she's just this force that kills without dying herself. But those first, the, the two lines preceding that sort of complicate that. That he must live longer than her because he's the one who does, at the end of the day, I guess to go back to the NRA thing, he, the owner of the gun, is the one with the agency to fire the gun. Mm -hmm. um, and without him, she just lays a loaded gun, just that potential. How as Dickinson may seem without agency, and in this context, yes, but in the end, who's still here? That's yes. exactly. <laughs> Can't kill this. This is Sid Corman all over again, right? As long as I exist. Well, actually, I think that she's even more powerful than that. She doesn't need us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she doesn't need us. But she's still there, and I think that this is um, more powerful than a loaded gun. Uh, I'm speechless. Anyway, so good. Susan Howe embraces Dickinson, and we sort of understand why, so we move forward from here. 